The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as religion, sports, aviation, business, literature, and politics. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Les Payne from New York Newsday. Glad to have you with us today, Les. Nice being here. Well, this is an interesting and exciting time to be in journalism. It's exciting times, indeed. <laughs> this election is a watershed in American politics, and it really points up the differences in our population mm -hmm. and the people who are advocating positions. Mm -hmm. What do you think the key issues are in this presidential election? Well, I think the key issues are the, the war and the economy, mm -hmm. without questions. And I think they loom, you know, rather gargantuan on the landscape. I think that uh, uh, time back it was the economy at this point when, when the nation was a, 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 a relatively at peace. And I think the Iraq war and its implements, uh, you know, and, uh, is, is just really, really uh, dominant. And you have the uh, twin behemoth of the economy, which is in the tub with a huge deficit, you know. And, and I think that these issues, as they're being debated between the two uh, candidates now, the sitting president and, and, and John Kerry, I think uh, I think the rub is beginning to meet the road. And I think the American public is beginning to see how each of them differ. And I think that one of the reasons that this election is so important is because I think that. You know, uh, there have been past years in which folks said, well, there's no real choice, mm -hmm. you know, that they're just, you know, two wings of, of, the, of the same Tweedle bird. Tweedle dee, tweedle dum. Yeah, but I, but I think that uh, there are really some differences on issues. That what are, are those key. differences? Well, uh, the, the, difference, the, the differences on the war. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a sitting president who has taken the country to war uh, under what has turned out to be false pretenses. Uh, he said and told us, you know, blaringly, uh, he and his administration, Cheney and the rest, that there were weapons of mass destruction and, uh, you know, even the nuclear cloud prospect, you know, was, 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 mm -hmm. was floated out to really scare people into mm -hmm. supporting the war uh, beyond uh, ways in which they would have ordinarily. And so I think that um, he, he took the country, and, and Kerry, you know, certainly have a very good opportunity to explore that. I mean, he, given his background, which he certainly uh, has, has, has pushed forward, I know you're, you're a veteran yourself, so am I, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, he has given a kind of credibility uh, to the issue, you know, of war and peace because he's up against a man in Bush, you know, who spent his days in the National mm -hmm. Guard and hardly there. Mm -hmm. So I think that their positions on the war, you know, uh, the sitting president having taken the country to war, uh, Kerry attacking that position, although he voted for it, true mm -hmm. enough, uh, but he voting for it is one thing. Taking the, he did not take the country to war, you know, uh, he, he, you know uh, not, not to defend him. And I think on the economy, I think uh, it's, it's pretty clear that this president came in in the year 2000, 2001, with one of the highest uh, uh, surpluses that the nation had seen the in highest, many, many, yeah. the highest. And now it has the lowest deficit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have an extraordinary mm -hmm. swing of something like two, mm -hmm. three trillion dollar swing mm -hmm. from, from surplus to deficit. Uh, but beyond that, and those looming issues, which are current issues that have to be worked out one way or the other, I mean, you have the uh, the, the key issues too. You know, uh, you know, there, there are things like assault, the position on assault weapons, stem cell research, mm -hmm. uh, tax cuts and tax breaks. Who gets get them and why and for how long? Uh, I think they differ on. Uh, in terms of their orientation, they differ on uh, the Supreme Court, and I think it's going to be a good year uh, to mm -hmm. look at. Uh, the, one of the questions that came up during the second debate was uh, what kind of Supreme Court justices would they appoint? I think the president kind of dodged that, you know, but his record is his record. But actually, he said he wanted a strict constructionist. Yes. Now, strict constructionists are people who gave us Placey versus Ferguson, yeah. the Dred Scott decision, and other things that helped black folks or kept black folks right. down. Right. The thing I was thinking as you were talking, there's a myriad of issues, and you and I are pretty sophisticated about those issues, but let's take the average black person in the street. Mm -hmm. Which of these issues do you think resonate most with them? Uh, well, I think that the war issue is an issue that really resonates in the black community, and I think one of the reasons it resonates is because we know ultimately who's going to be the people who are going to die out of proportion. Mm -hmm. And I think right now you'll find, that when you look at the figures, when you look at the profile of, of the body bags that are coming back now, it is pretty close. I mean, the number of African Americans uh, who have been killed in Iraq, 
uh, approximate roughly their percentage, into somewhere between right. 12, 15 percent. Uh, mm -hmm. But as the war peaks, and you know there's either going to be a draft or there's going to be a backdoor draft, which is say the number of soldiers have to increase because uh, the reserves and the National Guard are at a breaking point. Mm -hmm. no, no matter who's president, they're going to have to find a way to get more boots on the ground. Even to withdraw, they need more boots on the ground. And in, in Iraq, or in the theater, and in order to do that, they're going to have to come up with more man and woman power. And when they do that, they're going to expand the pool that they have been drawn from. And when they expand it, uh, we know the history of these things, and we not only know the history, but we see the evidence now, is that they're going to, quote, unquote, lower standards. Mm -hmm. And when they say they're going to lower standards, they mean that some of those people who they did not want in this elite volunteer army, mm -hmm. they now want in this not so elite vo uh, volunteer army because they know that they're going to be a part of the people who are fighting over there, getting blown up in car bombs and, and, and coming back in body bags. And we saw the same thing in the Vietnam yeah, War. Vietnam, right. and, and what happened in Vietnam, I mean, there was um, uh, a point at which uh, LBJ, uh, when the war peaked in Vietnam, first you had the elite forces, you had mm -hmm. Delta forces, Green you had the Berets. Green Berets, yeah. <laughs> John Wayne was making movies and it was glorious to go and to fight and to kill, but then when they began to find out that a part of war is also dying, then they had to expand the pool and what they did is that they reclassified uh, a hundred, the first uh, part of the program, I think it was in, it was in, in, in the late 60s, mm -hmm. uh, fifth, 60, uh, Five, six in there, is that they made a hundred thousand people previously ruled not uh, classified mm -hmm. uh, for the for for, for 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 combat. They said you are now classified mm -hmm. uh, properly to go and to uh, join the army and to go and almost die. directly to right. Vietnam. Muhammad Ali got caught up in that. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time when he was classified, he was he was not he was not one A. And, and, mm -hmm. and when they came back around. You know, they say, okay, now you can go. Yeah. And he said, wait a minute. Before he said, I was too dumb, and now yeah. you're telling me yeah. I want, and he refused to go. He was one of, but the point is that, and a disproportionate number of African American and Latinos got caught up in that. And I think that we begin to see evidence of that already, mm -hmm. because they are now, quote unquote, lowering the standards. They're beginning to increase the bonus uh, pay mm -hmm. to get people in. Uh, recruiters have been given instruction now to broaden their mm -hmm. net. And I think when they broaden the net, they're going to see a disproportionate number of, of, of blacks who are, who, are, who, are, who are going to be involved. But what do you think about our, our Congressman Charles Rangel's proposal to reinstitute the draft? Uh, it came up before the Congress the other day, and uh, it was voted down 400 yeah. to 2. And I think Rangel and voted against it himself. He voted against it because he said he'd made his point. Yeah. His point really was, the one that was in Fahrenheit 9-11, that the congressman's children do not get into the draft, the middle class, do get in the military, the middle class doesn't get right. And he said if you spread the burden, right. uh, then uh, maybe they'll be against the war. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that uh, if you look at the draft, when there was in fact a draft, there are always loopholes. That's what mm -hmm. I think about it, basically, yeah. is that, you know, people who have power, who are in position to control policy, find ways to create loopholes for themselves, for themselves. whether mm -hmm. it's the draft, or taxes. whether it's the tax breaks, right. whether it's who gets the, uh, the business, uh, health care. Uh, and so when we look at the draft, what we found was that a disproportion, and I just described one of the loopholes, mm -hmm. not only one of the loopholes, but one of the amendments that LBJ mm -hmm. uh, uh, made to the existing draft so that more African Americans ended up mm -hmm. in the military than mm -hmm. would have otherwise, mm -hmm. because, and, and fewer, and therefore fewer uh, whites. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so uh, during the Vietnam War, of course, you know, the National Guard and the Reserve were places where people like Bush and the wealthy uh, hit out, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so I, I think that even if there were a draft, there would be a disproportionate amount of African Americans going in and, 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 and getting drafted. However, it may be more equitable than it is without a draft because now the poor, the folks who cannot get jobs, you know, the people who It's the cannot, backdoor draft. Yeah. It's a backdoor draft. You know, they can't afford, mm -hmm. you know, uh, these ex extraordinary and almost uh, exorbitant uh, uh, and extortionate mm -hmm. Uh, college fees at some colleges, mm -hmm. some of the private colleges, and they can't afford that. And, and if they do find a way to afford it, they, they will be spending the next 20, 30 years of their lives trying to pay off their college loans. And so uh, to avoid that, they may go into the military with a promise that mm -hmm. you go into the military for two years, you know, we'll pay your college tuition, da da da. So your position is that the war is probably the most prominent issue for the black community. 
in terms of who they're going to vote for, but what about the economy? The unemployment rate for black folks in this country is up near 12%. Right. For white folks, it's around well, 5%. Yeah. Uh, it's always been right. that right. way. And yeah. then the question is, well, uh, how do you pr put those together? Well, because I think they both are. I, I think they're both a uh, twin behemoth. For for African American as are they as they are for Afri for other Americans you know uh, at this particular time and I, I agree with you that mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and and looking at the war I mean I think the war is such a moving target and it's such a dramatic mm -hmm. thing uh, that it, it it carries an emotional impact but I think the economy is one of those subtle ongoing erosive corrosive uh, realities that uh, African Americans should particularly be aware of you mentioned the uh, unemployment and I think if you look at under this president uh, uh, you know I don't want to get into to the issues of the debate because mm -hmm. you know your viewers can right. watch the debate for themselves because I, I have no mm -hmm. dog in that fight. I mean, my, my job profession is mm -hmm. not to defend either one of them, but to try to look at the facts. And I think that the facts are, though, that uh, unemployment is, is, as you say, twice as high for African American as it structurally is, you know, for the throughout the history of post-slavery in this country, and uh, it is higher than the president is going to tell you it is mm -hmm. uh, during the debates because they'll tell you that well it's creeping up to six percent. The reality is that discouraged workers, you know, which is really where a large part of black unemployment is hidden because they are discouraged mm -hmm. and they don't even seek mm -hmm. jobs anymore. And some of them coming out of high school and even colleges don't seek jobs for a sufficiently long time because they are discouraged. So the African-American unemployment rate is even higher than twice, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the white rate. So it's, it's, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, issue and, and, and the whole unemployment uh, disaster is going to have a, a heavy impact on African-Americans. Well, what about middle-class black Americans who say, well, the tax cut is going to help me I got $300 last year, and I'm going to get another $400, and the tax cut's going to stimulate employment. Uh, basically, the research doesn't bear that out. But how do you, how do you really get this? Because this gets cuts across class and race. Right. For example, in the debate, uh, Kerry said that it's 1% of the people who get 30% of the benefits. That's and true. It's a, it is true. Yeah. It, but then there's always this group of folks who say, well, look, if I didn't have to pay taxes. I'd have more money to buy a television, or more money to pay tuition. How 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 can that be refuted? It's clear that the facts show it's not true. But what, what's the strategy in refuting that? Well, I think that to the degree that African Americans are in the top one percent of the uh, economic class, which is to say they, their average income is a million dollars. I mean, Bill Cosby, Oprah Winfrey, right. okay, yeah. <laughs> they're great. About five other uh, people. <laughs> huge tax breaks, right. huge tax breaks for those. Some of the athletes, you know, during the years that they're playing, by the way, and they're going to be, most of the lives they will not be playing mm -hmm. and making those kinds of salaries, but mm -hmm. during the years they're playing and making $10 million, mm -hmm. and they think, you know, like Tyson and others, when he was making $35 million a year, okay, it would have benefited him. But he still owes the government money because he didn't pay. That's right. <laughs> So, but and, and and so, but if you're making less than two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, you know that tax break is just minuscule. Mm -hmm. And what is more, your tax dollars that you, the middle class, is paying black as well as white that you're paying is going to that one percent, mm -hmm. who, by the way, are not simply taking the, the benefits of those tax breaks and creating jobs. I mean, they are taking it to make more money for themselves, mm -hmm. putting it in offshore banking accounts, as you know. Uh, they, they run corporations mm -hmm. that, that are outsourcing jobs, which is say they are hiring people to answer the phones in, 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 in countries offshore where they can pay them a third or a tenth of what they're mm -hmm. paying, paying them here, So, which is to say, and when they do that with that tax break, the children of the middle class who got their three, four hundred dollars, you know, are the ones who are going to end up working, you know, in a, in a short order cook somewhere yeah. as opposed to being able to pay for college tuition, mm -hmm. being able to pay off their college loans, being able to get a job that is meaningful and that pays well, unless they're going to go to one of these other countries, and I won't name which one, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, there are various ones that, that mm -hmm. are in a strait where, you know, the, the labor costs are so low. Well, why is it then that the uh, Democratic Party in particular and candidates have trouble communicating this because when you listen to talk radio and you read the columns in the so-called major media other than Newsday <laughs> and your column, yeah. you find that they are, they're promoting this, that, that the economy is really going to be better. If you get rich people more money, they're going to make you rich. Well, how, how do you communicate that? You're a communicator. How do you get that across Well, I think that we have to say that the media is, uh, is, is not guilty as charged. And we're guilty as charged 
liberal with you know a bleeding hard liberals. It's, it's, it it's really isn't the case. Yeah. I think it and certainly is not the case today. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you could have argued it 25 years ago, mm -hmm. I mean, what has happened is that the uh, uh, hardcore. Uh, conservatives, you know, have infiltrated or have taken over, have gained influence, let me put the softest face on it, have gained influence in the media. And I'm not just simply talking about a given network that we all yeah. know about and mm -hmm. that a movie has been made about, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the Rush Limbaugh's of mm -hmm. the world. I mean, and so if you look at most of the talking heads, if you look at cable television, what do you see? Mm -hmm. You see white men sitting there endlessly yakking Mm -hmm. 24 hours a day, seven mm -hmm. days a week with themselves about their issues. Mm -hmm. And when they get an African American on, the rare time they get one on to visit, or, or even a woman, mm -hmm. you know, they are, they are people who are cut in the same cloth. Mm -hmm. So there is no debate. I think that the great delusion that is going on in the media, and the media is a, is a part of it, is that the media is being dominated by <laughs> white men talking to themselves yeah. who, in fact, you know, uh, think that they're shaping mm -hmm. policy. Now, on the one hand, you could say, okay, what you see on television is not true. White men talking to themselves about their issues. The American public is going to act differently. Unfortunately, there is a reality that he who, and it's not my original thought, mm -hmm. but he who controls what the people know mm -hmm. controls what the people will do. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very powerful medium. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to minimize just by simply dismissing mm -hmm. it as being white men talking to themselves. These are very, very powerful mm -hmm. people. They have extraordinary powerful influence on the way people are going to vote because people do watch television people do read these newspapers they are in fact influenced and unfortunately it may lead them to vote against their real mm -hmm. self-interest which gets to your question you know about African Americans African Americans watch the same television shows you know they watch the same news shows they listen to the same radio station they watch the same reality shows and they are influenced against their best interests and it is one of the great, you know, uh, conundrums, you know, of American popular society that uh, you have a powerful notion uh, that floats on the media that can get people to vote against their best interests. And if, for instance, if they vote, if you look at the sitting president, and, and, and I think everyone now knows that no weapons of mass destruction, they know that there's no connection between Al-Qaeda uh, and, and Saddam Hussein. In fact, they were uh, uh, rivals, right. if anything. Mm -hmm. And so, yet, if they, by some magic, would say, look, he gave us bad information, led us to war, people are dying, uh, the economy has been shifted, you know, five trillion dollars, and we're going to give him four more years to do it again? Mm -hmm. You know, why would they do that? Because I would suggest the only way they could do that, vote against their interest, would be that they have been fallen under the heavy influence of the big lie perpetuated by people, you know, who control the dialogue, control the information flow, and continue to uh, do not news but agipropped. Well, you talked about your profession, which is journalism. Yes. I talk about my profession, which is education. Yes. What are we doing wrong in education? that allows people to fall for these traps and to, in a sense, not understand the broader picture. Clearly, in our social studies, history, and so on, we really don't talk about those dark, but well, not racial, but those mm -hmm. issues that uh, we dealt with when we were trying to control mm -hmm. the war, we created a war mm -hmm. in the Spanish-American War and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, education, in a sense, is a public function, 87 percent of the children go to right. public schools. Right. So therefore, those of us in education have the same problem. How do we get the message across, even in academic terms, without being tagged as a bleeding heart liberal? Well, How guess, do we do that? Well, certainly, I'm, I'm, I'll leave that to the experts. I, I have enough problem trying to critique my profession or craft, uh, which I've spent you know, uh, three decades working in. Uh, and I certainly don't consider myself a, 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 an expert on, on education, although I listen to you and others, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, 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 and take and seek mm -hmm. guidance and direction in writing mm -hmm. stories, you know. Uh, in fact, what we write about education, we get from you and That's other right. enlightened, mm -hmm. and in some cases not so enlightened, educators and academics. But uh, one of the things seems clear, you know, is that I think on the, the big picture end of it is that they, they kind of work together. I mean, I think uh, the media, journalism, 
work together with uh, education, with, with the education system, re critique it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, over the years here in this city. I mean, uh, how the education system has been covered, how the chancellor has been covered, how the issues have been covered has had a, a profound effect because at the end of the day, it's the politicians, politicians who control it. And the politicians pay very strict attention to us in the media. And so there's a, there's a tripartite kind of a tri triangulation between, since we were talking about education, education, mm -hmm. the politics, and the media. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're all kind of working, mm -hmm. unfortunately, at sometimes at cross purposes. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, someone said that, uh, you know, reporters are really uh, scouts mm -hmm. for scholars. And I think in some ways we are. Uh, another way to say that is that uh, the newspaper business is, is uh, journalism is history in a hurry. Mm -hmm. You know, through 30 years later, you began to get your history. What we do, you know, is, is a short take on history. So I think that it is, you know, connected. And, and some of what we do in finding out information, you know, influences what passes for contemporary history. And I think that when we get it wrong, and what I'm saying now is we get in it, I think, as wrong as we've gotten it in the past, I think that it will have an influence on how this present history is written. That aside, you know, I, I think that in terms of the procedure, the techniques, uh, where the errors are made in history, uh, I think it's as, as simple as, you know, I went through the educational mm -hmm. system. It's as simple as uh, um, teach the child how to read mm -hmm. and let his parents and his community, hopefully in her community, teach them what to read. You know, I was involved in the uh, start of the Black Studies Movement. I started the Institute of African American Affairs at New York University. Hugely, and one hugely of our important. purposes was to get students, black and white and other, to read and understand some of the documents. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually did a television program where we would read some of the documents mm -hmm. about racism, about the struggle. Mm -hmm. um, that was topical at that time, mm -hmm. and a lot of black folks thought we had it made. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't have it made. Mm -hmm. But if you look around this set, it says, Vote 2004. Mm -hmm. The City University of New York has campaigns on all of its campuses to get students to vote, mm -hmm. to register, mm -hmm. and, then to, and to understand. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're doing at CUNY TV mm -hmm. is to have discussions mm -hmm. about the body politic and where we ought to be going. Now, another medium that is, is new is the Internet. Oh. Move on. The inter anti-war site has done a tremendous amount, raised a lot of money, raised the actual they catalyzed uh, Howard Dean's campaign. Uh, how do you think the Internet is going to influence, particularly in the black community, because more of us are using the Internet, in, uh, influence thought? I hope, well, some in my craft profession, you know, look at the Internet, you know, as a threat. You know, I don't at all. I look mm -hmm. at I look at it as, as, a, as a boon to what we do. I think the Internet put an extraordinary amount of information at your fingertips. You don't have to leave your desk. You have it. For instance, you know, the report recently mm -hmm. uh, that there were no weapons of mass destruction. You could download the entire report. report. You don't have to even download it. You just read it. Read it. Mm -hmm. And just read it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. unbelievable. I mean, the reports on racism, the report on uh, police brutality. I mean, these report that we kind of mention, you can mm -hmm. download. I mean, you have them at your fingertips. And I think that it can be used as a tremendous asset you know, to the teaching profession, I would suggest, and certainly to the student uh, 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 population. And I think that it, it, I think it can have a positive information uh, 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 impact. Now, the problem in my business is that you can't believe everything that's on it. That's but I think exactly that when you right. go to raw documents, oh mm -hmm. man, it's, 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 it's rather extraordinary. I mean, from the Smithsonian to museum, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I think that this information age explosion is its a great time really to be a student. I think it's a great time to be a, a, a professor as, as well because the information is so readily available. And I think that what you need to do is just to inspire teachers. I mean, the teachers need to inspire students to pursue mm -hmm. and to, to give them some direction, yes, as to how to pursue quality information so that uh, the American public or the individual can make uh, quality decisions. I mean, I for one think in, in, in this election, for instance, that, that, that the young populations are hugely important. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I think that I predict in, in, in city room, I'm not a good <laughs> handicapper, by the way, but everyone asks me in the city room, what do you think is going to happen? It's close. And I think that, I don't believe the polls no, uh, between really. Kerry and Bush. What I said, and you heard it here first, I'm predicting that Kerry will win by eight points. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we're seeing in the polls now is just, mm -hmm. 
has nothing to do with reality. Mm -hmm. What we're hearing on the radio and television it almost has nothing at all to do with reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Kerry will win by eight points. And I think that the reason why he'll win by eight points and the reason why it's no, nowhere near uh, uh, apparent at this point is not only because you have a bunch of white men sitting around with vested interests and deep biases and close identification with the wrong people. I think it is rather that they're not listening to very important people. I think women are hugely mm -hmm. important. You know, most of the voters in this country are women. That's right. Eight million more women voted, you know, in, uh, in, in the last election, 2000, than men. And, and yet they're not listened to. They don't, their position is not taken into account. The other thing is what you mentioned, young people. New registrants. New registrants. Millions of people are registered in swing states, and we're paying no attention to them. One of the reasons they're paying no attention to them, posters don't use cell phones. Mm -hmm. They only use landlines. Right. Have you ever seen, are any of your students using landlines anymore? Not I doubt anymore. it. They're all on the cell phone. Right. So they're not even touched. Yeah. Their opinion are not taken into yeah. account at all. And I think that that's why, among many other reasons, that what it's saying is hugely distorted. Right. Well, as I'm you, very optimistic about it. As usual, that. less pain comes across. He gets the prediction that I was going to ask. We'll see what happens. Uh, Les, I'm so glad you're with us today. You gave us some great insights about journalism, about politics in well, America. It's great and, to uh, We at CUNY TV believe that we should register, vote, and understand the issues. That's what we're dedicated to, and I want to thank Les Payne for thank being you. our guest on today's African American Legends.